This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about some examples of art in rings. So last lecture, we had this rather hairy theorem saying that Artinian rings are notarian. And we also showed as a consequence of the proof that any Artin ring is a product of local Artin rings, which makes them particularly simple to study. A typical example of this might be something like the Artin ring Z modulo 60Z. And the Chinese remainder theorem from number theory says that this is just Z modulo 4Z times Z modulo 3Z times Z modulo 5Z. So here we've got an Artin ring written as a product of three Artin local rings. And this is sort of fairly typical of what happens in general, except it gets more complicated. Um, so now what we're going to do is have a look at some examples of Artin rings. And we can classify Artin rings in terms of their length. So you remember every Artin ring has finite length. Um, and let, let's just do art in local rings. So if you've got an art in local ring, it's got a single maximal ideal M and R over M is going to be some field K. And um, if R has length N over K, it is in some sense about the same size as an n-dimensional vector space over k, although, as we'll see in a moment, it need not actually be a vector space over k. In fact, you can see it right here. So this is about the same size as a two-dimensional vector space over a field with two elements, but it's not a vector space. Anyway, so if we look at length zero, this is trivial. We just get the zero ring. Length one is equally trivial. We just get one example, which is the field K itself. Length two um, starts to get a bit more interesting. So one way of doing this is to take a ring, polynomial ring K of X and quotient it out by some polynomial F of X of degree two. So we might take it this to be K of X modulo, say X squared plus A X plus B. And now we get several slightly different cases we might get kx over x squared. And this is a non-reduced ring. You see that the element x is nil potent. Um, on the other hand, you might take k of x modulo x minus alpha x minus beta for some alpha and beta in k. And by the Chinese remainder theorem, this is just isomorphic to the product of k with itself. So here we have an art in ring that's the product of two art and local rings. Finally, we might have kx over f of x, where f of x is an irreducible polynomial. So this will just be a, 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 a bigger field containing k. So a fa fairly typical example of this, you might just take the field q of i, the sort of Gaussian numbers, which is just q x modulo the ideal x squared plus 1. So it can be a field or a product of two fields, or it can be this funny non-reduced ring. So these are examples that are vector spaces over K. We can sometimes find examples that aren't vector spaces over K. So a fairly what one we had up there was just the ring Z over P squared Z, which is length two. And here the, the, the quotient field K is just Z modulo P Z. Um, and in, in, for higher length, things like this that aren't vector spaces over K become a little bit tricky to um, classify. In fact, even the ones that are vector spaces become tricky to classify. So let's just look at some length three ones. Um, and here nothing terribly new happens. We can get things like K times K times K, and analogous to this, we can get things like K of X modulo x squared, and then we can take a product of that with k. We can take um, a field of degree three or the product of a field of degree three and a field of degree two, and we can get something that's slightly new. We can take um, a polynomial ring in two variables and quotient it out by the ideal generated by x squared, xy, and y squared. 
So now this is a three-dimensional vector space with basis one x and y, and any product of two of x and y is zero. Um, and in dimension four, things become even more complicated. So let's just have a quick look at some examples of length four. Well, here, for example, we could take um, our ring R and it might have a maximal ideal. And this might have a, um, it has the square and the cube of the maximal ideal. And we can take this to be zero. And we might take this to be dimension one we might take this to be dimension three. And now you notice we've got a map from m over m squared to m squared over m cubed. And this is dimension one. So we can identify it with the field K. And this is dimension two. So, and, and, and our map could take x to x squared. And now what we've got is more or less a quadratic form on a two-dimensional vector space. So, so there's, a, there's a sort of quadratic form encoded in this. And um, over various fields k, there can be quite a lot of quadratic forms. For instance, if k is the field of rational numbers, there are a fairly large number of quadratic forms in two variables. And again, instead of taking this to be, this quotient would be two dimension, higher length, this could have dimension higher than two. So the, the classification of these is going to be more complicated than classifying quadratic forms over the field. Um, for length greater than or equal to five and six, the classification becomes starts becoming really rather complicated. Um, um, in fact, what happens is it becomes so complicated you can't really describe the classification. Um, and this is something whenever you try and classify nil potent objects. So, so if we've got an art in local ring with maximal ideal m, you know the, the ideal m is nil potent. So m to the n is equal to naught for some finite n. So we, we've got a sort of nil potent thing lying around. Um, and nil potent things include art in rings. And they include, well, nilpotent Lie algebras and they include things like finite P groups. And what happens with nilpotent objects is if they're only generated by one or two things, you can usually classify them. But as soon as they start being generated by too many things and being a sufficiently high dimension, the classification goes completely wild. For example, for finite p groups, um, I'd looked up the number. The number of order of order two to the ten, which doesn't look all that imposing, turns out to be four nine four eight seven three six five four um, two two. So um, the number of nilpotent finite groups grows very, very, very rapidly with the dimension. And it's sort of hopeless to classify them beyond a, beyond a rather low point. Um, and what I'm going to do next is to show that um, for art in rings, the classification again goes a little bit wild as soon as the um, length and number of generators becomes a little bit too big. So we can ask, what is the dimension of the space of art in rings that are um, over a field K that um, have dimension um, N and have M generators. So what we're doing is um, we've got M generators. So, so we take the field K1, K of X1, X2, up to XM, and we quotient out by an ideal of co-dimension n. And we can think of these ideals as forming some sort of space. And we can ask, what is the dimension of this space? Um, well, one obvious way to get ideals like this is, is to take um, n distinct points in affine space a to the um, m, or 
which is just k to the m, and then take the ideal i to be all polynomials vanishing on these n points. And we've got n points in m dimensional space. So that sort of gives us an mn dimensional space of art in rings. Um, and in general, you can try and imagine a general art in ring um, like this to be some sort of limit of um, n points moving around an m dimensional space. And this would suggest that the dimension of the space of art in rings is mn. And this is a very plausible argument um, which everybody thinks of when they first start studying this question. And it works for m equals 1 and 2. So m equals 1, it's sort of trivial, because there you're just looking at um, i is just going to be an ideal generated by a polynomial of dimension n. And this obviously has dimension n times 1. And for m equals 2, it's still true. But for m equals 3, it just fails totally. Um, in other words, there are more ideals of co-dimension n that you might guess than you might guess by um, using your geometric intuition about this. And it's not very difficult to see that there are ridiculously large numbers of ideals in dimension m. I I'll just write down a few of them. So, so let's just look at the ring kx1 x2, x3, so we're just taking m equals 3, and let's take the ideal m to be um, the ideal generated by x1, x2, x3, and then we can look at m to the i, and I'm going to take the ideal to lie between m to the i and m to the i plus 1, where i is some integer greater than 0. And now you notice that any subspace I, like this, is in fact an ideal. So we can generate lots and lots and lots of ideals of finite co-dimension by taking any, any, any subspace of m to the i over m to the i plus 1. And let's just try and estimate very roughly how many of these we're getting. Um, so um, um, what's the co-dimension of this? Well, the co-dimension is, I don't really care exactly what it is. It's something of order i cubed. I mean, it's, it's roughly bounded above and below by some constant times i cubed. And similarly, this also is co-dimension i cubed um, up to some constant. This also is co-dimension that's roughly i cubed times some constant. Um, and then we notice that the... Um, dimension, oops, the dimension, let me try again, that oh, worked, the dimension of m i over m i plus one is, you know, some, uh, roughly some constant times i squared. So the dimension of the subspace of subspaces of mi over mi plus 1 is about order i to the 4. Um, so the space of all subspaces of a vector space is called a Grassmannian. And if a space has dimension n, then the dimension of the, of the space of the Grassmannian is some constant times n squared, very roughly. Um, so we've got enormous numbers of ideals, but the co dimension so, so the number of space of ideals has, has dimension something times i to the 4, whereas the co-dimension of the ideals is something times i cubed. And this number here is going to be approximately the number n, which is the co-dimension, and the number m is going to be 3. So um, the co-dimension of uh, this ideal i is going to be order i cubed. Um, so, so mn 
will also be of order i cubed. And this is very definitely less than the dimension of the space of ideals, um, which is order i to the four, order i to the four. So what this is saying is that um, art in rings with at least three generators tend to be a bit weird and they're rather hard to imagine. Um, that there is actually a space parameterizing them called a Hilbert scheme that was um, constructed by Grothendieck. And people have studied these quite a bit, especially for spaces of dimension one and two. But as soon as you start looking at spaces of dimension three or more, the Hilbert schemes become kind of wild. Um, the, 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 the rule of thumb is that anything that possibly can go wrong will go wrong for a Hilbert scheme. Um, so um, let's have a few more examples of art in rings. One way in which art in rings often come up is uh, as a tensor product of two fields. For example, what happens if I take the tensor product of the complex numbers with the complex numbers over the reals? So this is a algebra of dimension four over the reals, so it's an art in ring, and it splits as a product of art in local rings. Um, so, uh, in fact, it splits, it, it turns out to be just a product of C and C. Uh, by the way, don't confuse the tensor product here with the ordinary product here. It just happens that the tensor product of C and C happens to be the ordinary product, um, same dimension as the ordinary product. That's because 2 times 2 happens to be the same as 2 plus 2, but you really mustn't confuse these. Um, well, if it splits as a product of two things, these should be generated by idempotence. Because the unit of this will be an idempotent in this ring here. So what are the idempotents? So in this ring here, we should be able to find two idempotents. You can write them down like this. It's 1 times 1 plus i times i and over 2 and 1 times 1 minus i times i over two. You can check that both of these square to themselves. So they, 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 they give this decomposition of this art in ring into a product of art in local rings. Um, we can do another example. Suppose we just take Q of root two, tensor over Q with Q of root three. Then this is actually a field, um, Q of root two, root three. So sometimes a tensor product of rings will be um, a field, and sometimes it splits as a product of fields. So you can see that's that's the tensor product of R. Um, we join the square root of minus one on both sides, and here we join the square root of two and the square root of three. So we can ask, when does a tensor product like this become a product of fields, and when is it just a field? Well, that's fairly easy to answer. So let's um, let's look at k tensor over k with L, with k and L separable finite extensions. When I say k and L separable, I mean k or L is going to be separable for the moment. Um, so um, let's suppose that. L is separable, so we can write L is equal to K of X modulo F of X, where F has no um, um, multiple, um, so, so, so F is a separable polynomial, so it has no um, multiple roots in the algebraic closure of L. And then k tends over k with L is easy to figure out. This is just the same as k of x modulo f of x. And now we notice that f may split in k. So we're assuming f to be irreducible here. So it's an irreducible polynomial in little k of x. But it might not be irreducible in this. So it splits as a product of factors f equals f1 of x f2 of x and so on. And these, uh, um, the key point is these are all co-prime. 
And the reason they're co-prime is that f has no multiple roots. So, so f has no multiple roots, and f has no multiple roots because of this separability condition. And this implies these polynomials are co-prime. And since these polynomials are co-prime, the Chinese remainder theorem implies this is k of x1 over f1 of x times k of x2 over f2 of x and so on, which is equal to a product of fields. So, so we see that if L is separable, then this Artin ring decomposes as a product of Artin local rings, and all the Artin local rings are just fields. Well, um, I've been emphasizing this separable condition several times, so obviously you can ask what happens if it's not separable. Well, if it's not separable, something a little bit weirder can happen. Um, so let's take k equals k, and let's join the piece root of a, where um, k has characteristic p greater than zero, and A is not a p power. So we're assuming that x to the p minus A is irreducible. Um, and let's take L to be um, uh, k times the p root of A as well. So, um, so L is equal to little k of x and then we quotient out by x to p minus a. So k tensor over k with L is just equal to k of x to the p, sorry, k of x over x to the p minus a. Um, and let's say big K is equal to little k of b. So b to the p equals a, and I'm calling it b rather, rather than x so we don't get confused. Um, and um, now you notice this over k, this factors as x minus b to the p. So this is equal to k of x over x minus b to the p. And now you notice this has large numbers of multiple factors. And this ring here has nil potent elements. So it's got this nil potent element, um, x minus b, for example. So in particular, this isn't a field at all. It's, it's some sort of art and local ring with nil potent elements. So this is still an art and local ring. But it's it's not a field or a product of fields or anything like that. So so um, in in characteristic p, if you're working with inseparable extensions, some slightly weird things can happen when you look at tensor products. Um, um, I ju just just finish off by remarking that um, in general, the tensor product of two Artin rings need not be an Artin ring. For instance, if you take the tensor product of k of x, that's the field of rational functions in x over k with k of y, you can check this is not an Artinian ring. So the, the, these are infinite dimensional over k, so perhaps that's not too surprising. Um, okay, that's enough about Artinian rings for the moment. Um, next lecture, we will be discussing associated primes of a module.